you have been a successful scholar, you have been a provost, and now you are a library dean. And I'm wondering about the skills, the similar skills that are required for those those positions, the similar skills that a, a scholar would need uh, as a, and a library director would need, the similar skills a provost would need and a, a library director, director would also need. But I'm also interested about any unique skills that a library director has to develop. I'd like to hear a little bit about mm. that. Well, there's no one way to do any of these jobs. Um, people who are asked to do them have to figure out how their skills and how their capacities match up with what's there. Um, I had another earlier career in which I was a chief information officer at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I've drawn on that experience thinking how here again I get to work with uh, extraordinarily qualified professionals who, here's the good news, none of them will suspect that I think I can do their job better than they can. <laughs> Uh, I didn't get promoted from the ranks. Getting promoted from the ranks is great, but if you don't, a virtue of it is you can share skills, complement one another, um, and I can be there for them in ways that uh, they're not so prepared to address. And I have to depend on them to do the things that they have the professional training and expertise to do that. Maybe the only other thing I would say is that having been a provost uh, gives me one particular advantage in this job, which is that I have a better idea than I ever would have had before how to manage up. I know what the library looks like from up. So I have a better idea what's reasonable to expect of my bosses, a uh, better idea of what it's reasonable for them to expect of me, um, and I hope I can advance our organization inside the university. Um, the better for that. I have a question about the field of librarianship then. Um, one of the things in my career that I found a little curious was the lack of a requirement of professional development. It's encouraged, but it's not part of our profession. And now, both from the view of a scholar and a provost, and now a dean of libraries, what is, uh, two questions, what is your thoughts about that for librarians, and I would say also personally for yourself, is there uh, subjects in the field of librarianship that you feel that would be useful for a dean to know? Well, sure. We do have in the structure in our institution um, a requirement of professional development for our professional librarians. I think what we're finding, and many of my librarian colleagues around the country tell me this, is that the old hard and sharp line between the professional MLS bearing librarian and staff doesn't work anymore mm -hmm. because many of the people who carry positions that are designated as staff are themselves serious senior responsible professionals without whom we could not function. And so we need to build the community of collegiality between staff and professional librarians and to the greatest extent possible um, eliminate class barriers anyway, retaining professional and functional differentiations and complementarities um, as we go. Um, I think the librarianship, like many other professions, has changed. Keeping up is harder than it used to be. There's new stuff all the time. Uh, one of my personal recommended strategies is to attend the Charleston Conference as often as possible. <laughs> Very wise good. choice. Wise, wise choice. choice. I'm, I'm glad you agree. <laughs> you talked about some new and provocative ideas, and you, you, you turned uh, strategic directions, I guess I would say, that libraries need to, need to be looking at. You called them three priorities, I think is how you phrased it. I was wondering, for those folks who weren't able to attend, if you could talk a little bit about those priorities. Well, so I'd frame it this way. First, um, I always like to talk about three priorities ever since a colleague of mine about 20 years ago uh, looked at me and said, you know, Jim, if you you've got more than three priorities, you probably don't actually have any priorities. Um, by the time, if it's more than three, it's a to-do list uh, or a guilt list, and it's a different kind of thing. But I would also say quite seriously that I think one of the things I can bring to this job is a history of not having been down in the weeds and therefore, there are advantages to having been down in the weeds, but my advantage is um, I can spend time, this my first year in the job, um, looking for the horizon um, and thinking in the larger picture about where we need to go in the 10, 20, and 50 year time frame. And then building back from that to say what's really important right now. 
Uh, there are plenty of things that are important right now, urgent right now, that don't have that kind of strategic long-term effect. Uh, there are things we need to address. Mm -hmm. Um, I partly think of this in terms of my time and effort. Those are things where appropriately delegating to staff and trusting that they will get done is the right thing for me to do. It's probably the right thing for a library leader to do to have those three priorities and make sure that all the bits and pieces of chicken feed work you have to do are understood in their relationship to those priorities and that appropriate high level resource and time allocation goes towards pursuing those uh, pursuing those priorities. Um, one of the things I said in my plenary was that at the operational level, nothing has startled me quite so much or struck me as a problem that needs fixing as the question of ebooks, how we buy ebooks and bring them into the library. Basically, I'd say the relationship between the library user and the ebook vendor that we get caught in the middle of is broken. Um, the things we're now producing as ebooks in libraries aren't ebooks, they're not very functional, it's got to change. Well, that's very important and very urgent and a lot of money is involved right now. In the long run, I'm confident that will get fixed. Mm -hmm. I'm confident we'll get to a better place. Um, by the ordinary working of good professionals and uh, people responding to their users, thinking about what we need and pushing back to the publisher community. The long-term issue is how we build the most accessible and useful collection of library materials embodying current research and the cultural heritage of our societies that people can actually use, that don't disappear, that do get taken appropriate care of, that young generations coming along learn how to make use of. That's our core strategic job and in that context um, getting the ebooks right is one little stream down here even if it happens to be the one that's had oil poured on it and it's running on fire right now. The um, many libraries, most libraries, have to justify their value to the institution. It's one of the largest cost centers in a, in a uh, college or university. And uh, you've talked about the e-books, which is a, a very immature industry at the moment. It's really mm -hmm. only been around for a while. But um, when I look at things that are a little more mature, and I'm speaking specifically of the journal literature, the big deals, the bundled packages, I've found over the years both um, a lot of duplication in those bundles. You must get all the bundles because there is 5% that is unique and so much that is duplicated. I'm wondering, in your roles as provost and as dean, how can universities influence the industry to make the return on investment, frankly, better for the institution um, to justify the expense of the library? Well, there's, you have to recognize first there's only so much we can do. I think we do a pretty good job of doing that. Um, we are a sufficiently defined industry, particularly in the United States, uh, that it's possible for the 120 members of the Association of Research Libraries, uh, for the small number of thousands of institutions of higher learning to talk to each other, there are people to talk to each other, um, and to set standards among ourselves of what we're willing to pay for, what we're not willing to pay for. Um, we worry a lot about whether we've got enough money. You know, we are always going to worry about that. There will always be too much. If we suddenly got all of our budgets doubled, among other things, the number of startup publishing ventures that would follow immediately to help us think about the allocation of those resources would be striking. Um, we need to tell stories to ourselves and among ourselves about what it is we're doing, why we're doing it. We need to be smart about what we collect. We need to be smart about what we take a pass on. I think we do need to be more cooperative and collaborative with each other in collection development. I know it's an old grail that people have been chasing, uh, but there are technology reasons why we can do a better job of that now. Um, we belong to the Great Western Library Alliance, which is a consortium of 32 institutions, about 28 of which share their library catalogs and allow patron-initiated uh, interlibrary loan. Um, that's a really powerful service. It's quite new in that form. 
but it's already making a lot of us look and say, so just how many copies of this book do we need among these 28 libraries in order to serve responsibly all the users in that place? We've never been able to ask that question intelligently before, but this is the old story of if you can measure it, you can manage to it. Mm -hmm. If we can start to count some things like that, we can start to think about how we change our behavior. You said this morning uh, that, that really uh, it, it just jumped out at me, and I, I've read it use writing it on uh, lib licensed as well and this notion of all our students being online or all our you know we all, all our students are online and what do you mean by that and what implications does it have um, walk around a small liberal arts college and it might not dawn on you as quickly as it does at Arizona State University where we have on our, our Tempe campus 60,000, we call them now, full immersion students walking around the campus. On a busy day, 45,000 of them are taking a course. And on that busy day, 10 to 15,000 of them are finding their way into our central building and another six or 7,000 finding their way into our, science, our large science library a couple of blocks away. So it looks like the library has a lot of face-to-face -face use. But if you walk the stacks of our buildings, the students are not there to make use of the material collections. Um, if they are, it's fleeting uh, grab-and-go use. Uh, we've invented grab-and-go as a form of dining. Um, we do grab-and-go librarianship now. They come in to get something, take it away, use it someplace else, and they may indeed be ordering it to be delivered to the front desk. Um, I know this for a very important personal reason, which is that my office now, it's a dream of an office for me. I've, I've got a key to the library after all these years. <laughs> My office is on the same floor as most of the books that I use for my scholarly work. And when I want one, I go online, I click a couple of times, and I pick it up at the front desk on my way out of the building because it's just easier to do that. So if we look at the behaviors of our students, we realize that even when they're in our buildings, they're not really in our buildings as traditional library users with pencils taking notes on, on rare books. Uh, and on the other hand, they're all of them using our collections and services online abundantly, mm -hmm. 24 by 7 by 365. Once upon a time, and I'll say that's 20 years ago, it was possible to say, we have our buildings, those are our libraries, and we supplement that with a little electronic content. It's time, it's jargon language, but it's time to flip the model and say the real library services, the real library collections are the ones that are being accessed online. What we do in the buildings is really important, but we need to think about how what we do in the buildings is no longer the center of our activity, but rather uh, an important portal to understanding our collections, learning how to use them, learning how to use tools, but the real action is going to be elsewhere. If you take that step and conclude that all of our students are online students, a very scary prospect opens up. It means that all of our services need to be available and deliverable to all of our online students. And that's a historic change. We're only partway through being able to deliver on that. I talked in my presentation about the importance of mass digitization and access to digitized books because if the books are only on the shelves, as wonderful as it is for them to be on the shelves, they're, they're, I, I'm not even going to say they're going to disappear. Most of them have already disappeared. They're gone from view. They're gone from use unless we provide intellectual access to them in appropriate, uh, in appropriate ways. And people are looking for full text. They want the actual text, the digitized text. I do. You do, right? Sure. Yep. Um, reading a few snippets, that work for you? Mm, I can work my way around it, but not hardly. The 